The first thing is going to be binding kinetics. This is really kind of our bread and butter here. Bind one molecule, the ligand on the biotensor, and then in real time, you can watch it analyze, associate, and dissociate. You can take that a step further and start looking at steady state when they have association and dissociation no matching. They're going to create an equilibrium, which can also give you some really cool, interesting data. And then with a brand new software feature, we've introduced IC15 to see if you calculate it. So if you're interested in potency and comparing the potency between the different molecules, that is something that we're uh, capable of doing with the software now. Sample quantification, maybe sort of a, a step back away from the top. The complexity, you've got a standard curve or reference material that you make that stands as a bit. Compare it to your unknown samples and you can elucidate how much is in a sample based on the signal from the standard curve. And then the last thing, some of the other label free uh, assays, the main one or the big one is probably going to be episode binning. If you're not familiar with that, it's when they go two molecules are trying to find at the same time through the same. Thing. And if they are finding the same spot site, the same epitope on that antigen, then the first molecule is going to lock the second molecule by an inhibition assay. If they are binding at the same time, then you can glean that they are binding different sites. And this is really for when you're creating antibodies and you want to elucidate where the binding sites are from a big panel. Um, you can combine plates, and I've seen as many as two or three hundred antibody panels. Uh, excuse me, uh, where you're buying, you're comparing which one to buy at the same time and which one's going to be. So uh, I mentioned these, these are the different biosensors. They come in a number of different chemistries to choose from. <laughs> Things like streptavidin and protein A and protein B and nickel. We've got a number of different antibody captures for you to use. Essentially, they're about the size of a small uh, pipette tip, about a P20. And on the very tip of them is a reference layer followed by the bio layer. And the bio layer is going to change based on which one. The way that these generate signal is white light that can be shown that shot down through the tip of the biosensor. And when those biosensors go into the well of a 96 well plate, things can start binding to them based on that chemistry. Part of the light is going to get bounced back off the reference layer mm -hmm. at a specific wavelength. Part of the light is going to continue through. And when something binds to the tip of the sensor, the returning wavelength is going to shift based on how large that molecule is, how much of the molecule there is, and uh, how fast it binds to that binds. Okay. So what you're really looking at is a wavelength shift in the return wavelength based on what fast. <clears throat> Quick little animation to kind of further elaborate on this. When the biosystem dips into a well, it's going to lengthen based on what's in binding to it. Is that a nice association? Because the signal shift is increasing. You can allow that to get into just a buffer well and allow all those molecules to come off. So you can start watching your return to the baseline wavelength and moving the signal range. <laughs> the octets come in a number of different flavors, and we are constantly trying to improve and upgrade these things. One downstairs is a bigger model. But the direct upgrade for that is going to be this octet R8. They can pick up eight biosensors at a time and dip into a full column of the 96 well plate. But it can move back and forth across the plate as you're building your complex and importing those signals from the The One of the key limitations of the one downstairs, because it's a little bit older, is the sensitivity. So the one downstairs can't quite do small molecules. It's going to have a uh, cut off of about in, um, five kilodons, excuse me, uh, five thousand kilodons, five kilodons. Sorry, I was just, I was talking small molecules earlier and I got all my dogs and put on this thing. Five kilodons, of course, uh, larger for the one downstairs. While the newer and higher sensitivity one you can go and measure all the way down to about 100 kilodons, so very, very small molecules. 
it can determine a smooth range from one node molar all the way down to 10 picomolar. And the newer instruments also have much better temperature control. So you can think of it from 15 C all the way up to 60. <coughs> This is kind of what the insides of our instruments look like. On the left here is one of our smaller boxes. You can see there's eight bio sensors picked up and dipping into a nice control plate right here. And it's going to be able to go back and forth across this plate as you can see basically what you tell it to do in going to which of those different columns. The larger instruments have higher throughput and also do trying to get plate position. You can also do three and four roll plate. And these are capable of picking up. Uh, up to 96 fire sensors at a time, so you can do a full plate for it all at once. If you're more familiar with really tight binders, it might take a very, very long time for those binders to fit, so to speak, and for you to calculate an off rate in order to calculate the KD. And the longer the dissociation, the longer your app is. You might start running into evaporation problems once you get to you know, four or five hour mark. So we've designed this little evaporation cover to sit on top of the 96 volt plate. And then it has this shutter system where these two rods will actually push one of the shutters down, exposing a single column of the 96 volt plate on the side. So you can lengthen your assays up to 12 to 18 hours without going into evaporation. One of the questions I get the most is can these biosensors be used more than once or are they single use? And the answer is it depends. Some of the biosensors can be regenerated multiple times. If you take protein A, for instance, you can bind to the FC region or FC tag molecules at the end of uh, most antibody. <clears throat> antibody binds to the center. If you dip this whole thing into acid, it's going to strip away all of the uh, all of the antibodies. Leaving you with a blank center. You can use that up to at least 10 times. So you can do a whole 96 volt plate with just eight bios, which is pretty good. Some of the sensors, like the streptavin ones, I'm going to talk about the streptavin ones a lot today because they're probably my favorite. If you have a biosimilated molecule binding to the streptavin biosensor, chances are that's not going to be all being sweet. You're going to be using uh, this is the ligand and then this is the analog to determine association, dissociation, or some sort of a live replacement or something more than just a simple molecule. <laughs> if you were to dip this into the some regeneration solution like acid, it's not going to come off. The bioconstruct acid is like a fifth to a molar affinity and it's going to be super strong. But what you can do is dip this whole complex into some regeneration solution and pull off the analyte, leaving you with the ligands still attached. That can be reused as long as your regeneration condition don't start to degrade whatever this ligand is. If a ligand, uh, an antibody to acid, it's going to start to unfold and degrade, right? So make sure if you do the, go this route, make sure you're not using something too strong or too degrading. Or so maybe just test it out a few times before you start testing the really important sample. Mm -hmm. yeah. The next uh, quick quantitation workflow mm -hmm. is we've got our 96 volt plate, H5 sensor, and then we've got a column for regeneration and neutralization. Neutralization is because you don't want any excess acid going into your next angle, so you've got a lot of it really, really drops off. Mm -hmm. So we'll dip it to the first standards, create a nice uh, concentration dependent dose response. You can uh, extrapolate a standard curve, regenerate, dip into that acid, wash the acid off. Same biosensor going into your next samples, and you can elucidate the concentration based on the amount of sigma. Right? That is what we call a one step situation where the biosensor is dipping straight into the sample. It can be very, very fast. Usually, you can do a full 96 volt plate in less than half an hour. Uh, but that's not always the right sensitivity data. It not, might not be uh, enough mass on the sensor, enough signal, 
might have a really small concentration. Okay, but that's good for uh, low milligrams up to high milligrams per mil. If you need a little bit more sensitivity, you can start adding a detection step or start adding that to the sensor. And you can do it in a very creative way, or you can do it in a very specific way so that you know what you're finding in that lot of times. And it takes a little bit longer, but you can start getting down using the from the middle range for first annotation. If that's still not enough and you have very low concentrations and very low uh, low molecular weight, you can do an elytra replacement. Okay, you're going to take a third molecule. Which is attached to an HRP. We're going to dip that into a well that has a metal diamond, diamond of benzene or metal DAB. When that occurs in peroxide, the metal is going to precipitate onto the tip of the sensor. And that precipitation is a very large molecule, right? Comes out of solution. And that's going to amplify your signal at least tenfold. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes a little bit longer, but you can get down to those very, very low concentrations. Okay. Most of the time, when I have customers who want to replace an ELISA and remove an ELISA to the octet, <clears throat> these last steps are just for detection. They don't actually need to go that low in concentrations. The color change from the HRP and not the metal, but the you know, orthogonal peroxidase typical ELISA situation to be read on the plate. So most people can actually get rid of these, this step and just switch to the two molecules. This is a typical two step assay. We've got a quick baseline followed by a loading. You're going to want your sensor to be evenly coated for all of it because you don't want any, um, you know, you want the same number of binding sites for your second step. And then you test your association or your dose response curve from your practice material, etc. This can all be done very fast. Typically, this is going to be about uh, 12 to 15 minutes. You can shorten things, you can expand things. <clears throat> Once you have the association, that's where you're going to go to your standard curve processing. And uh, <clears throat> our software can actually do it a number of different ways. You're going to have the option of looking at four parameter or five parameter or linear, weighted versus unweighted for all of these different bits. And then for the, uh, the binding rate equation, a couple of different things to consider. First off, you have the typical endpoint where you're taking just the signal at the very end of the assay, kind of like you're doing an ELISA and plate reader, you're only reading it at the very end, right? The problem can arise when you're matching out your signal for all of these hot concentrations. When that occurs, you can actually look at the initial slope. If you were to zoom in to the first couple of milliseconds, you would see that you do have some. Uh, a very different, a very uh, separated search response curve. So you can actually take that and put some weight to it and then create the nice ended curve, uh, which is not maxing out in a plateau. Then. <laughs> Next up is kinetics. This uh, flows right into a couple of slides ago. You can imagine this with just another step right here, which is the dissociation. Okay. With uh, another animated short workflow, you've got your eight biosensors. <clears throat> Did a quick baseline to make sure that the signal is stable. Go into that loading ligand step. You want to make sure that that's not falling off, so you've got another baseline or kind of a lock step there. Mm -hmm. Go into your um, dilution series of your analyte association. Go back into your buffer and allow those molecules. What that's going to look like in real data is something like this. So it looks pretty different, right? It doesn't have that really fast off rate, which looks very pleasing to the eye. Uh, this looks a little bit trickier, right? That's because this is a much tighter binding. This is probably low nanomolar binding. And you can see we've got a very long dissociation set because it's so tight. You need to get at least five to 10 percent decrease in signal. In order to calculate a pat an accurate offer, you get a good answer. Once you iron out those parameters and those step times, you can go into the analysis and you're going to get quite a bit of information. Uh, I've pulled out probably the, you know, the top eight or so 
but you're going to have all sorts of other, other different things. This, the table that this fits out is huge. You've got all sorts of different things that you want to work out on. Generally speaking, we've got KD, KR, or KA, KDIS, or KD, the errors associated with all of those. So this is uh, 0.3 nanomolar plus or minus 0.001 nanomolar. And then you've also got some fitting criteria like the chi squared and the R squared. R squared, probably everyone knows what that is. Closer to one, the better. Chi squared is a little bit different. That's the measurement of the amount of error in between the fit. Lower error, the better. Lower the chi squared, the better. The fit. And then you've also got the residual. This is the distance between the fit line, which is red, and then the colored line um, at every second during this curve. Typically, you want less than 10% residual for the amount of signal. Okay, so if the fit line is really far off, obviously it's not a good fit. But if the other, if for one of those, but if the other six or seven show really close fits, your chi squared to R squared might be okay, but your residual might be way off. And maybe you could eliminate that top concentration that was too high or something like that. Okay. A lot of Processing for kinetics goes down to recognizing when non ideal behavior is occurring. Ideally, you're going to want to do something that if you run it for long enough, eventually you will see this sort of plateau where one ligand has bound to one analyte, and then that's it. It's going to kind of plateau because we're reaching this equilibrium or the association and dissociation of magnet. And then at the other end of that, you want to get potentially your hero in a nice even manner. If you start to see things like it goes up quickly and then it still goes up but kind of slower and the same sort of biphasic decay, you're going to you're experiencing non ideal behavior. And it could be that things are more complicated than going to one, it could be one to two, or sometimes things being in proximity to other things binding can kind of make it move around on the sensor. Ideally, you're going to want to decrease all of your concentration to ensure that the spacing between the molecules is such that only one molecule can bind to one other molecule. Okay, so avoid the avidity and sort of the moving around. So, and for the octet, actually, less signal can be much better than the most signal possible. Okay. <clears throat> For getting the thing that you want, we've got lots of different options. You can always drop the highest to the lowest concentration. You want to make sure that you're aligning everything correctly in the nice zero zero. <laughs> Are you performing the correct reference? Do you have a buffer blank? Are you getting non specific binding where your analyte is binding to the sensor and not binding to the light? Yet? You're going to want to account for that. You can block it or you can subtract it out. Uh, it is steady state analysis providing a more accurate KP. For things like small molecules or very fast binders, it would be really hard to calculate something based on just this for a couple of seconds, right? But looking at the steady state or the equilibrium, you can actually calculate a KD value from just that portion of the curve. Uh, also, windows of interest. You've got very fast genetic, like these small molecules here. It can be tricky to um, get a good off rate. You know, the residuals here are very large. All the fit curves are further down, but you're not quite going that fast. Okay. If you shorten the amount of time that you're actually calculating for the first you know, five to the second, which is probably where the most accurate uh, uh, dissociation is occurring, as soon as it hits that buffer, dissociates, but then it's in all it's still in the well, right? So <clears throat> if enough is dissociated, into the well, you can actually have some start to bind back to the light because it's not being washed away. So maybe that's a little bit of what's happening right here. So you just want to look at the first couple of seconds. So that's quantitation and kinetics. Um, notice I didn't really say what those molecules were, or at least a little bit. That's because you can do those for such a broad range of antibodies and proteins, small molecules, viruses. Um, you cannot do whole cells. Whole cells are too wobbly. They've got too much liquid in them, and they're not very, uh, they don't produce a very stable signal. So, anything between 150 dogs and whole cells is probably going to be able to do something on that. 
few of those other label free applications I mentioned that could have been in the beginning. This is your typical inhibition assay. That's one molecule blocked with the second molecule. And you can do it in a couple of different ways immobilizing the antigen and then testing. Everybody wants to choose. You can sort of mix them or create their typical little or sandwich, uh, or you can pre mix something. Um, yeah. Ideally, this is probably going to be the best one. If uh, due to orientation, the orientation of the antibody tag to the image from here, this one might not have enough room to get in and buy like this right here. This is because it's too close to the sensor, there's not enough room. So, you really need to sort of think about how things are going to be lined up in the spatial orientation of everything, such that you get a good problem. When doing this, you actually need to test antibody one and antibody two, and then you also need to flip it and test antibody two and then antibody one. Okay, so you test it both ways to make sure that all of your antibodies are binding and they're not just sterilized and not going to bind at all. Like the software can create this really nice looking map. Where you've got your antibody in the first position, antibody in the second position. And then red means that they don't bind together. The first one blocks the second one. And then green means that they do bind at the same time. So very quickly you can tell without a whole lot of uh, zooming in and you know trying to figure out what's binding or what's real signal, what's not. You can automatically see it. And based on the amount of threshold that you're setting. That's the amount of signal of the second position compared to a signal from the first one. And then you get this other really nice image where all of these kind of in the same valence instead of their thinning. Uh, all the ones that find the same epitope get put into a bin, and you've got a nice little color figure there. As well. This is a list of most of our biosense. Biosensor chemistry, so you can see a few of the ones that I mentioned Pro A, um, antibody capture, Tricadabit, Nickel. We've also got a few sort of immobilization kits if you're interested in those. But I'm showing you this to highlight the small molecule or the super Tricadabit in biosensor. I mentioned earlier that less signal can actually be better for most of your experiments. That is not true for small molecules. Because they're so small, they're not going to produce much signal. So you want as much on there as possible. So we've got these high density surfaces. We bind to a biosimilar to a in, bind as much on there as possible. And then your small molecule will generate typically, you know, somewhere less than 0.2 or 0.3 nanometers of signal. You see this, uh, they did a hit allocation screen. Tested hundreds of molecules for hits. They took all the hits and then tried to do a, um, a to, to calculate the KD from those hits that they got. So they down selected, and now they're doing a, a better job of selecting the good ones. Uh, but just want to notice, you know, 0 0.15, 0 0.06, and all of these are real signals. Okay, they did the right subtraction, they did all the right references, and they were able to determine that, yeah, these do bind at these KDs. So if you compare, you know, 0.15 nanomolar uh, nanometers of shift to a previous sample where we're going to get up to 4.5. That's going to be a huge difference in tablet done challenges to make sure that it's real safe. Okay. Um, so, this is the interesting paper that I recently read. They were detecting exosomes on the octet and doing exosomes. Uh, you know, so they had this peptide called really mm -hmm. eight that binds to the cellular domain of the HS70. Um, and they were able to quantitate actual patient the HS270 exosomes in actual cases. Okay, so they got a negative control. They weren't quite sure if this was real signal or this artifact. So they had this positive control. And they were able to uh, isolate those HSP 70 containing exosomes. They also looked at A8 binding to HSP 70 versus its typical uh, toll like receptor target. And they were able to say that uh, A8 could potentially act as an inhibitor based on the hydro binding to the HSP 70. So, exosomes on the octet. Um, so, our next. 
an uh, interesting update of our software is actually our EC15 and IC15. So if you're familiar with the S curves and you know relative potency and things like that, you've got EC15, which is the concentration, which is producing 50% of the maximum signal that is generated. Okay. And what we know is comparing to EC50. So if EC50 is smaller, you've got a um, more potent molecule. If the EC50 goes higher, it shifts to the right, you've got a less potent molecule. And this is uh, something that you know I used to do back in the lab um, four years ago. And without this, I took all my octet data on my like softmax and had to figure out how to import and export everything and fit it that way. Now you can do it all in the octet. Uh, a little bit about virus like particles and microparticles. Mm -hmm. This is a really good example. I believe this is from BioVim, but don't quote me on that. Uh, they wanted to look at the kinetic between the microparticle and the antibody, but they didn't have a good way of immobilizing either of those onto the viruses. So they found a third molecule, this new germ, <laughs> that was biotinylated, it bound to the light particle, and then they were able to measure the kinetic structure. So Great example of the versatility. If you don't have the chemistry that you're looking for, add in another molecule, you can probably make it work. Mm -hmm. uh, AAB2, um, this is just a quick example. We've got new biosensors coming out, so I wanted to highlight that a little bit. Uh, AAB are capsids, which contain payload of genetic material that can be used for lots of gene therapy and all uh, whole suit or other things. Generally speaking, the only way to do this on occasion is PCR. You're probably the best. You can do ELISA, but once you do it on ELISA, you probably have to double check it on the PCR. And the PCR is super slow, it takes a couple of days. You can only do uh, five to ten samples at a time. So put it in 96 volt plate, put it on the octet, and you can do it in just an hour or two. The way that we previously did this was we had these AABX antibodies from Capture Select. Okay, personally, I've used all of these different serotypes. AABX can bind to one through eight. It has been shown to bind to nine also, as well as RH10 and a whole bunch of different um, mutations of all of those serotypes. Which I mentioned a second ago, coming soon is our brand new AABX biosensor. We partnered with the Capture Select folks, and that actual antibody is being put onto our biosensor. And you can just know loading steps is generally just dip those into the AAB, copy that loop in 5 to 10x just to make sure there's no non specific binding or interference. And then you can start quantitating with the reference material. So lots of um, Infectious disease, uh, especially in the last couple of years with COVID. Um, I just wanted to highlight some of the really cool work that's been done. Zika, HIV, and uh, flu, all of those have been studied on the octet. And generally speaking, people can get this data very fast and get their papers published very, very fast. When COVID first hit back in March 2020, there was about 15 papers of SARS CoV 2 study on the octet by June and first July. So it took a very, very short amount of time to print that data out. It took on very fast. Mm -hmm. uh, as I mentioned, the versatility of this instrument is just massive. This is not this is not an entire list. This is a little bit of an old slide, but you can get a good idea of what all it can do. Aptomers, exosomes, DNA, RNA, all of those things have been done successfully. Right? Uh, so if you have questions about any of those, I'll try to answer them. I'm not an expert in all of those things. I don't think anybody could be expert in all of those things. Um, over on the right, though, is a really cool list of buffers and matrices that have been used on the I-10. Because it is a different read, there's no prefix. Everything is staying in the well of the 96 well plate. So you can do a whole lot of different uh, and challenging matrices on the octet without causing any damage. So things like uh, milk, honey, beef slurry, sounds kind of gross, but you have to have a board. 
uh, all of those things are applicable on the architect. It would probably have its own set of challenges, but it's not going to damage the infrastructure. So I'm happy to um, take some questions if any of you guys have some, but uh, that was my presentation. Just, just curious. Um, what we call the more architectural is that they have a very uh, high sensitivity that we can utilize. Can we look at finding the small molecule down to say 150 dolphin? Yeah. So is that place that is in, in the realm of the capability of doing enzyme genetics, classical enzyme genetics? So enzyme genetics happens so fast. That a lot of times instruments can't really detect how fast it occurs. Yeah. Um, but if you had a really slow enzyme, and as long as the enzyme found mm -hmm. and it stayed found, a lot of times it'll find and then do a check and then come off very quickly, also. That means with just going to be a tiny little blip of signal. You really want it to stay bound to generate you know, a few seconds of signal to be able to calculate it. Yeah, so sorry, I probably missed the first part um, because I, I just confused about how, so like what the light ligand you can use in your assays depend on the different type of biosensor, like yeah. attached to the, the, the one. Um, yeah, so we can do that. The ligands that you're going to want to use are going to be defined to some of this chemistry. In order to mobilize it onto the sensor. So, like ligand, like the biosensor fixed, and then your things you're going to test or sample, like throws you and fight to that as kind of principle. Yes, yeah. Not flow through, but just yeah, yeah. If, 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 yes. Yeah. So, yeah, if your molecules have a biotin on them or they have a his tag, you know, those are the kind of the things that you're going to want to think about for your mobilization. <laughs> So commercialized particles or biosensor, we have to purchase, and then the rest, like we prepare the plate. So we do have a number of plates that we recommend for you to, for you to use because it is a light, you know, a light system. So we need to carefully consider those uh, parameters when we're using them. Uh, but yes, <clears throat> you buy from us the biosensors, and then you got to uh, purchase all the molecules or manipulate the molecules and the plates. Well, with our, with our for the um, molecules that have like a like the unideal behavior and they're bonding more than one, like how like can you still run that and get like relative data and it just might be a good? Oh sure, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's gonna kind of depend on how well your R squared, your chi squared, and everything is. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you start to see that non ideal behavior, it kind of depends on what you need to do with the data. If you're good, if you've got hundreds of them and you just want to sit down, select just like the most, the five most interesting, then you don't need you know, perfect data on 100, take the five and optimize it. So another question. So about the epitope binding stuff, you only know if you're binding to the same epitope or not. You are not, I mean, I know it's kind of stupid to ask. You are not know where it binds. You just know by grouping, like where they bind the same. Yeah. yeah. Uh, a lot of times you'll have some of the commercial antibodies mixed in there. Yeah, that's the right. Epitopes, yeah. And then mm -hmm. you can link some more information down there. That's a good point. Thank you. What small molecules? Uh, do you know if someone had tested two small molecules to see if one is binding in a binding pocket and the other in a kind of allosteric pocket, for example? It, it, so I'm talking the case of two small molecules on one protein, for example. One would bind to the different binding pocket and another one in a, a, an allosteric pocket. Um, if you want to make sure that they are binding on two different spots or if they are binding on the same spot. Yeah. Um, so Theoretically, it would be possible. Um, I think, though, if you're looking at this amount of signal, it's going to be really tough to determine. You know, if one is bound here, and if two is bound, it would be like right here. 
So is that a true difference? You can really tell uh, that you can consider. Could you go on the dip and the second dip? Like if you oh, sure, yeah. Uh, but but you, you can go into the second dip, chances are that small. The first one's going to be small. Yeah. So come office means like you rinse that, then you do another dip. So if you want to test them at the same time, they have to be in the same well or um, yeah, for, for this question. Yeah. 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 So then the only way you could do that is if you had a mutant protein that didn't have either the allosteric site or the the other site. Yeah. And then you two you know, compare them. Yeah. One minus the third, one minus the other one minus the other. Okay, well, um, yeah, check out our website. We've got a lot of cool stuff on there. Um, we've got application notes for, I think we're up to about 27 or 28 different types of application notes. There's a whole bunch of different stuff on there if you're interested in writing more. Um, I've got a few business cards on the table. If you want to email me with questions, I'll be able to them. If you're worried about price, you can complain to the guy in the corner. You're probably not the guy. That's control. Yeah, I think it's a big one. Yes, I thought we didn't put my phone call. We got a but I thought about something they did with your Do we need to buy everything? I